All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I hope uh, everyone's had an opportunity to enjoy some of the warmer weather and sunshine uh, we've been experiencing today. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Rodriguez, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager with Toronto Arts Foundation. We're delighted that you're able to join us today for this webinar, um, you know, uh, in this online world that we found ourselves in. I'll keep my remarks brief today as my role is really as a moderator for our Q&A towards the end of the session and to help troubleshoot any technical issues that might come up. As some of you may know, the foundation is hosting this webinar as part of a Creative Champions Network and is going to be hosted by Ginny Stolk, our network director. While we hope for a smooth session, we are grateful for your patience as we troubleshoot any technical issues that may come up. Well, next on my list is to set the proverbial stage for today's webinar. After these introductory remarks, we'll proceed with the presentation. Now, if you have a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A function, and please feel free to ask a question at any time during the presentation via that Q&A function. Please specify in your question which presenter you'd like to direct your question to. It helps us keep the Q&A moving quickly. Well, we, we will address uh, the questions at the end of today's webinar, and we'll strive to get to as many questions as possible, but we'll be prioritizing the most frequently asked questions. Now, while there was no request for ASL interpretation or closed captioning for this session, we are recording it. We will make a recording and a transcription of the session available on our foundation's website as soon as possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Ginny, our Creative Trust Fellow and leader of Creative Champions Network. To you, Ginny. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody for being here today. Um, Jacqueline and Alexandra, I want to just say a few words of additional thanks for your input into the development of the Korean Champions Network, for your invaluable assistance with our webinars, including this one, and as always, for the technical expertise I totally rely upon. Thank you. Um, so this is the eighth webinar since the start of the pandemic. Um, previous to that, the Creative Champions Network met in lovely small rooms um, with wine and cheese and people had a chance to network. But I have to say that the webinars have been, I think, serving their purpose. Our goal has been to help boards um, navigate what's really been an onslaught of very novel difficulties and to bring together some inspiring ideas and hopefully to also inspire courage uh, to you in facing your many new tasks um, uh, and unexpected tasks and challenges. But I feel that now we're almost at the point where we can begin to focus on what comes next. Um, some changes, and we've seen so many, some changes will be lasting. And one of the most noticeable um, during the past year has been the large number of retirement or, or simply comings and goings among artistic and professional staff. Now these are not necessarily because of COVID, but I think they definitely signal a different landscape ahead. Um, I personally believe that similar change and evolution will also be true of boards. Pro it'll probably be less visible. Um, I don't think we're going to see articles in the Globe or the Star as our board members change and new people come on our boards, but I think this will have as important an impact on our two organizations as the changes to the professional leaderships. So what makes me think that? Um, well, I think part of the transition uh, uh, that we'll see on boards uh, will be because of exhaustion. It's been, a, it's been an exhausting year. Um, some of it will be because change always leads to more change. But um, the past year has also been a testing ground um, uh, around the urgent need for all hands on deck, for everyone to come together, bringing their best ideas and varied skills and experiences to solving what have been really difficult problems which by the way is how really good boards have, have always worked. Um, and really good boards are needed now more than ever. Um, during this most high risk of years, it's, it's become clear who around our board tables is contributing and making a very positive difference and who really cares, who is putting heart and soul into their board work. So whether your board has had the practice 
of regularly evaluating the groups and each individual's effectiveness or not, I think real life has provided that evaluation this year. Um, in addition to the overturning of almost everything about business as usual, there's also been rapid and urban, urgent changes in community expectations around equity, BIPOC representation and voice. So there will be changes on our boards and perhaps the reason we have so many people here with us today is because you're already grappling with them. Um, our introduction to this session said that board composition is at the root of board effectiveness and that renewal and succession is one of an arts board's most important leadership roles. I'm happy to say that our panelists today have fought long and hard and bring significant professional and personal experience to understanding what that means and how to do it successfully. Before I introduce them, I'd like to invite you to join together in acknowledging that we're living on sacred land, uh, which has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years or more, and the traditional territories of many traditional peoples. And in being mindful that we are only the most recent peoples who have the responsibility to care for and to nurture this land. This year, I think we're being called upon not just to honor the spirit and wisdom of those first peoples, but to be in active solidarity with indigenous women and men's pursuit of justice and reconciliation, which is really a call to conversation and transformation in pursuit of a new and more equitable future. Um, Beyond that, I think that spring also reminds us that the cycles of life continue and that we've been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. To our panelists, um, they're a very distinguished group, so I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Uh, Denny Young is a specialist and has taught and research board recruitment and management. And he's currently the board chair of Toronto Mendelssohn Choir, lucky them. Meredith Bod has an impressive um, work history uh, and she's currently an MBA candidate at the Rotman School of Management. And she's recently been working with a major nonprofit organization on best practices in recruiting for diversity. And Robin Cardozo is well known for his senior nonprofit leadership positions. Uh, he's currently executive in residence at the Rotten School of Management. And he's also the co-author of the recent uh, paper, Not-for-Profit Board Diversity and Inclusion. Is it essentially window dressing? So um, a good group and I hope a good discussion. Um, Denny, could I ask you to lead us off? Thank you, Jenny. I'll just take a moment here to bring up my slides. There we go. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, first thing I will say is that a takeaway file with keynotes of my presentation will be posted in the comments section. So uh, I'm going to be brief, but uh, there are, there's, there's home. There's things to take home after this. Uh, a few years ago, uh, as Ginny mentioned, as part of my master's degree research, I looked into best practice of board recruitment. Uh, first thing I did was gather what experts say is best practice, and then I went out in the field and compared that against what actually was taking place in a number of U.S. and Canadian performing arts groups. In the years since then, I've continued to gather information about board recruitment and uh, particularly it's been a fascination of mine. And now, as Ginny mentioned, I'm chair of the board of the Toronto Mendelssohn Choir, which uh, gives me a chance, like likely everyone else who's here today to put into practice what uh, I've been studying. Uh, I'm doing my best to practice best practice. And that's what I've called my presentation, practicing best practice coming from arts organizations. You already perfectly understand that no one is ever perfect. No performance is ever perfect. The key is to practice, to learn, to practice some more. So I'm going to share six stories with you. Uh, these stories are based on my research and what I've observed in the years since, but they are fiction. 
I made them up. So don't spend your time looking for clues. I'm not cleverly trying to portray any specific person or organization. These stories are just created to give you a quick look at good or bad practice um, and each portrays a particular factor of it. We'll start with Craig's connection. The theater company's nominating committee is trying to decide which person to pick for one vacant seat on its board of directors. There are two candidates. Mark was suggested by the community relations VP at BA Bank. BA Bank donates to the theater company. And the bank VP said that up and coming executives of the bank need to demonstrate community service. And Mark, she suggested, should join the board to polish his resume. Mark is a 37 year old investment banker. He's divorced with two young children. In his spare time, he coaches boys hockey in winter and teaches sailing in summer. He's a member of the Royal Canadian Yacht Club and he sits on the club's finance committee. He has no history of attending theater company shows. Nominating committee members figure that his annual income is close to $1 million. Craig. Craig's first contact with the theater company was as a volunteer usher during high school, and he continued doing that when he studied drama at Ryerson. After graduation, he went to law school at Queens. He stopped ushering, but bought two subscriptions and attended shows with his partner, Jason, when he was home on, in Toronto on weekends. Craig is now 63 years old and a partner in a small labor law firm. He and his now husband, Jason, continue to be subscribers. Jason is a high school music teacher. Their total household income is estimated to be in the range of about $400,000. Craig recently contacted the theater company's board chair offering to volunteer in any capacity that would be helpful. Practicing best practice, the nominating committee has chosen to recommend Craig to the board. Best practice recognizes that board members who have an affinity for an organization's mission are more dedicated, more reliable, and more generous. Suba's surprise. The music festival just added Suba to its board. An accomplished musician, teacher, and CBC radio host, Suba has performed at the festival three times in the last five years. Board Chair Scott is proud of recruiting Suba to the board. At first, she was cautious. And she asked about the time commitments, what were the donation expectations, and she very specifically asked if she could still perform at the festival. Scott assured her that they'd work it out for her. At Suba's first board meeting, the festival's CEO hands Suba a package of information containing several documents. Among them, a conflict of interest policy, a schedule showing board meetings every two weeks, a pledge card for an annual $2,000 donation and a financial report showing that the festival is currently having a five figure deficit. As she's absorbing this new information, the meeting begins and the first agenda item is a vote to ratify the festival's new statement of values. Suba notices that the statement speaks of transparency and honesty. After the meeting, she approaches Wendy and Scott she says, does the conflict of interest mean that I can't perform at the festival? Scott says, well, 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 we'll work it out. Wendy says, no, you can't be a performer if you're a board member. Suba then says, I can't afford the $2,000 donation. Wendy says, well, that's what board members have to do. Scott says, don't worry. I, I figured that you could use your radio show to ask people to donate. Suba points to the financial report and asks, is the festival really that far in debt? And Wendy says, yes, but now that you're on the board and making connections, we figure we'll get businesses in the South Asian community to become sponsors. As Scott and Wendy engage in another heated discussion, Suba heads home where she composes an email to Scott and Wendy. The subject line, with full transparency, I hereby resign, honestly. The thing is, words are nice, but does your recruitment follow your own stated practice and your values? I found quite often recruitment did not. People talked about their organizations being transparent and honest, but then didn't share information with board members until they'd made the decision to join the board 
or they were told different things by different people. So practice consistency, that's pretty key. Frida's frustration. Frida is arriving at her first meeting of the dance project board. She's never been on a board, but Frida feels confident that she will be a helpful, productive member. After all, she already sits on the parents committee of her son's alternative school, where parents, staff and teachers engage in monthly discussions about everything from school operations to what to teach and even how to teach. Frida's neighbors love her because she gets things done. Every two weeks, she attends the meeting of her housing co-op where 60 residents sit down and make all the decisions using consensus. Frida enjoys the lively discussions and seldom notices that the meetings run three hours or more. And dance continues to be a big part of her life. Two evenings a week, Frida runs dance classes for homeless youth at her neighborhood community center. So now as Frida settles in at the Dance Project board meeting, she's excited to see that the first item on the agenda is approval of a new program for dance for teenagers. Frida asks a question. The board chair tells her that discussion can only occur after a motion is on the floor. So someone makes a motion, another person seconds it. Frida starts to ask her question again, but the chair interrupts her to say that the mover of the motion is entitled to speak first. I yield the floor, says the mover. So now Frida asks, will this new program only offer classical ballet? Yes, replies the executive director. In our 50 years, we have never strayed from our classical traditions. Frida then starts to comment, but the chair interrupts her to say, this is a governance board. We don't interfere in operations. Several directors then start saying, call the question, call the question. The chair then says, all in favor, carried. That's kind of how it all goes. And then Frida is surprised when the meeting ends after only 35 minutes and the room empties in a hurry. As she's putting on her coat, feeling alone and confused, the chair hands Frida a book titled Robert's Rules of Order. Heading for the door, he says, you should really study that before the next meeting. The thing is, our board meetings are conducted in a way that's completely foreign to the way most people make decisions. I dare say that when you're in your home trying to figure out whose turn it is to cook dinner tonight, you're not practicing Robert's Rules of Order. It's okay to have formal pre uh, programs to run your board. The, the challenge is make people aware of that's the way things are done. Don't leave it until they've joined the board to find out that they feel excluded because the process to them is, is completely unusual. It's a common way that people have their first interaction with the board that's a negative one. Missed one. I have to go back. Maybe I didn't. Okay, we're going on to May's match. May is excited. Tonight she's becoming treasurer of the music school's board of directors. Two years ago, May joined the board after a thorough process that helped her understand that her love of music and her professional expertise would be highly regarded and very valuable to the music school's continued success. Four years, 40 years ago, at age eight, May started violin lessons at the school. She was good. She was really good. She won competitions, she sailed through exams, and she loved playing. But May's parents were fearful that she couldn't make a living as a musician, and they encouraged her to take business and economics at university, and she did. But she also kept playing violin too, including four years in the principal violin chair of the school's elite orchestra. At the same time, May became more and more passionate about finance. Top of her MBA graduation class, May went to work for the big province pension fund. She's now its chief financial officer and it's a job she loves. But tonight, she's equally excited to be taking on this volunteer leadership role for the music school. May said that with her head for finance and her heart for music, it's a perfect match. She knows that the school is facing some tough financial challenges, 
but may will make certain that it continues to be going strong when that next eight-year-old walks through the door and for the first time picks up a violin and a bow. No one joins a board with the intention of failing, but they do. And it's often because their interests and skills don't fit what's needed. Honor a recruit's time and their knowledge and their expertise by making sure that you're providing them with a situation where they can succeed. Rami's relief. Rami's boss tells him that if he wants to move up in the company, he should get some community service on his resume. Rami asks friends and family for suggestions and his sister-in-law Gail says that a family health clinic in her neighborhood is looking for board members. Rami calls the health clinic and in a few days, he is meeting with board members Greg and Lisa at the clinic. They're warm and welcoming and enthusiastic and they thank Rami for visiting and then they take him on a tour. As they move him around the building, Rami becomes more and more uncomfortable. Since childhood, he's always hated hospitals or clinics or even dental offices. Greg and Lisa are bursting with pride as they talk about the clinic. Rami wants to show appreciation, but he can't stop worrying that he's soon going to see blood or hear a sick person crying out in pain. They finally end up in a quiet room where Lisa and Greg say, are you okay, Rami? Can we get you water or anything? No, thank you, he says, that's very kind. I'm sorry, it's just that places like this make me really uncomfortable. Greg says, hey, Rami, we appreciate your honesty. Volunteering should be an enjoyable thing, fun even. Rami says, you're not angry with me? Not at all, says Lisa. Last year, Greg tried to get me to volunteer at his golf club and I told him I'd rather die. Greg then says, yeah, and she wanted me to join her choir and all they sing is stupid Broadway stuff. Rami, it was good to meet you, but the point of a meeting like this is to help you find a successful fit, something that you feel good about, not something that makes you sick to your stomach. Rami says, but you two love this place so much, aren't you offended? Don't you want everyone to volunteer here? No, we don't, says Greg. We want volunteers to love this place as much as we do, sure, but we know this cause can't be everybody's cause. You've got to find a place you're passionate about, Rami. Rami then says, uh, Greg, is that golf club still looking for volunteers? We need to practice no pressure recruitment. Uh, Canadians are terrible at saying no. That's the one thing I did really notice between my, the US and Canadian organizations I studied. Americans are quite willing to say, it's not my thing, I you know, love it, but not my cause. Canadians don't know how to do that very well and they'll actually join a board when they don't want to. So you need to look for those hints that they're uncomfortable or not interested. You need to stop thinking about guilt tripping them into joining your board because I promise you this, People that join a board, even if they hate what's going on, they're really hard to get off the board, oddly. They kind of stick like glue and, and they don't really do anything, but they feel that it would look bad if they quit. And so they stick around and everybody feels awkward about it. The recruitment is when you have the chance to make sure they're gonna feel comfortable and you're gonna want to work with them. And finally, Larry's letter. After several meetings, tours, visits, interesting and enlivening conversations, and lots and lots of reading, Larry's head is spinning. He's enjoyed meeting the Pinewood Center's board members, the staff, the volunteers, and the clients. He's been impressed when observing the excellence of center programs. And being a guest at a board meeting gave Larry the chance to see that he would feel comfortable there. Louise, the board chair, is due at Larry's office shortly, and he's sure she's going to make the ask, Larry, are you joining our board? And he's almost certain that his answer will be yes, but he wants this board experience to be better than the last one. This time, he wants to be absolutely sure about what's expected of him, because Larry hates to fail, and he hates that feeling that everybody else is thinking he's neglecting something or doing something wrong. 
As Louise enters Larry's office, he thinks, well, it's decision time. After exchanging greetings and settling in, Louise opens a folder. She says, Larry, this is a letter of agreement. It outlines everything that we've talked about in the past weeks, board responsibilities, liabilities, meeting schedules, donation expectation, it's all there, Larry. At the center, we value transparency and honesty. We would like you to join the board, but only if it's right for you. Larry starts to speak and then he hesitates. Louise says, Larry, I don't want your decision now. Take time, read the letter carefully. If you have any questions, get in touch. Again, we believe we would enjoy having you as a board member and we think you'd be proud of your contributions to the center's success. But take your time and make sure it's what you want to do. I'll be in touch in four or five days. After Louise leaves, Larry goes over the letter. She's right, it's all there. All those things people told him, things that he was afraid he'd forgotten or misunderstood, it's all there, outlined clearly. Two days later, Larry calls Louise. He says, if this is any indication of how professionally and thoroughly and thoughtfully your board operates, then please count me in. We do letters of agreement for staff, for contractors, for suppliers. Why don't we do it for the people we're recruiting to our most senior role in the organization? We all go through those experiences where we take in a lot of information at once and we start to wonder whether we understood it all. And there's nothing better than outlining that all in writing and then giving a person a chance to thoughtfully consider it. Those people will be your best board members because they have gone through a good process. And then at the end, in writing, it's outlined what's expected of them. And you've given them a chance to read that and not expected their answer immediately. Just wanna wrap up by saying, once somebody joins a board, and this is something I'm paying a lot of attention to now as chair of the board at the Mendelssohn, is making sure that people feel like they're contributing, making sure that they feel like what that it matters that they're involved. First thing that we like to talk about doing and we're working on putting into effect is making sure that every new recruit has a buddy, somebody who's a veteran board member who can fill in all those gaps. Uh, I was once told years and years ago that soap opera writing covers two and a half days in five days of, uh, of, of broadcasts. And the reason is they have to repeat everything so that when somebody who is new to watching the broadcast can pick up the story quickly. So the, the dialogue's very stilted. You'll hear people say, Wanda, who is my sister-in-law, the one who had a, a coma last year, just told me, you know, nobody talks like that, but they do in soap operas. We don't talk like that in boards. We jump in, we start moving, and people, even if we've done our best work in preparing them, are going to have moments of getting lost. They need someone they can rely upon. We, uh, I'm just about to launch something at the Mendelssohn. I've created an anonymous feedback survey that board members can go to and give me, the, the chair, feedback about meetings or about feeling like they can contribute, they can't, feeling like they don't feel that their opinions are respected. They're all basic, really quick questions there that just will give me feedback that I need to improve my chairing, chairing skills. Every board should have an annual review process that is in two parts. How did we do? And how did each of us do? This year, I posted for the Mendelssohn board our goals for the year. What are we going to do this year as a board? And we agreed to those. So we will look back on those in 12 months and say, how did we do? At the same time, our governance committee will look at each individual board member's performance and then I will speak with them individually and we'll see if how they're feeling about their experience and give them some feedback about how they're doing. All of this to say that the key thing that I found out is that the best boards take this seriously they hold each other accountable. They don't make excuses. They don't give people a chance to slip and slide out of the requirements. They, they make this as important as it is. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Denny. Um, so it's all about people, is it? <laughs> a lot of it is about people. Um, 
Uh, thank you for your, your stories and your good advice. Um, Meredith, um, I'd love you to speak next um, and to share some of your thoughts and things that um, you found through many discussions about recruitment with an emphasis on recruitment for diversity, including age and gender diversity. Meredith. Sure thing. OK, and you can see my screen OK? Yep. Great. Um, Thank you so much, Ginny. Thank you, Denny. Um, and thank you all for having me here today. My name is Meredith Bade. I'm a second year uh, full-time MBA student at the Rotman School of Management. Um, and I have participated in the onboard program at Rotman, um, via which I've been paired with the Toronto Foundation this year, working on a project for them. Um, and in particular, I was working on board recruitment with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and then in the second half of the presentation, I'm going to be talking on uh, age diversity and particularly looking at um, millennials and younger generations on boards. Um, so just to jump right in, um, I focus, as I mentioned, on diversity, equity um, and inclusion on board recruitment. And the first, you know, I think the first key takeaway, just to jump right in, is, um, is that it's equally important to determine skill um, and diversity needs at the board level, but to start with skills. Um, the overall goal is to really enhance board effectiveness and make sure that a board um, is performing and it's seeing through its mission. So we really need to start with skills. I know that somebody, um, I think uh, the individual's name was Naomi, typed in the chat um, about um, like tokenism and token hires and, and no one wants to feel that way. And that's always why we start with skills, examining what skills are needed um, to further the mission of the board. And so that's something that I did with the Toronto Foundation. I looked at the individuals who were leaving the board. There were four of them within the next two years who were leaving. Um, and we just examined together um, what, what gaps might there be in skills that we're going to need to replace. And so firstly, kind of it's a replacement exercise, but secondly, we have to think of, okay, where is the Toronto Foundation or where, where does you know, your nonprofit, where is it looking to go over the next few years? Are there skills on this list that are not present that we should include there. So that's kind of the first way that we were thinking of um, like board recruitment. But then also, of course, we consider diversity needs too. Um, and so I think um, another key point that I wanna mention is that diversity is both, you know, we, we talk about it, we talk about it. It is both important um, intrinsically and instrumentally. When I say intrinsically, I mean that diversity is important for diversity's sake look, you know, we'll say things like looking like the city, right, or feeling like the city. Um, but also diversity um, is, I, I would say, even more important because what it does is it fosters this concept of diversity of thought in that different perspectives are brought to the table that lead to ultimately different opinions and better outcomes for the board, enhancing that, um, that board effectiveness. So that's kind of um, a thing that I wanted to, to underscore there. And so what we had done um, with the Toronto Foundation is just looking at um, our board makeup um, and especially the board makeup when the lever, when the four levers leave and, and see, okay, where are we deficient in certain areas? Um, where are we, where are we overrepresented in certain areas? And that could help, um, that could help inform our um, recruitment efforts. And um, I think that, um, I, I, you know, I, I convey this in a way that's like a benchmarking activity um, or like a quote activity or targets, but I really want to just like, I think it's important to stay away from that kind of mentality. So while it is de facto kind of a benchmarking exercise, it's not meant to be a benchmarking uh, mentality in that we have to hire this and this and this, and these, this is exactly what we need. It's more meant to be kind of a vision, um, more meant to be that um, the nonprofit is, um, is working towards its vision at being equitable, at being diverse. And so therefore it's gonna hire or bring on board members um, accordingly. Um, something else that was interesting that I have found, which is that um, there's not, um, skills and diversity are actually not totally mutually exclusive, right? Like diversity can be a skill set. So when we're thinking about um, enhancing diversity on a board, we actually want people to be versed on the value of it. and and that we're looking for individuals with um, experience in these areas, D, E, and I, um, that goes beyond the putting together a, um, you know, a luncheon, at the diversity luncheon, right? Like it's what advocacy work has an individual done for um, a community that they're a part of or a community that they're not a part of. And that kind of finding has really stuck with me and 
Um, and I want to share it with you all because it's um, kind of helping inform the way I'm going to be living my, or I've, I've tried to live my life um, going forward. So moving on to more of the equity piece, I think that, um, or I have found rather that processes or the, the outreach and the selection process um, in particular can be made more equitable by being made more formalized, more objective and more measurable. And starting with the outreach process, um, I think overwhelmingly it is the case um, from what I've observed, um, from what I've read, and also from talking with my classmates in that onboard program who are also working with other nonprofits that word of mouth is really the prevailing method for recruitment or for, for outreach and sourcing candidates to join the board. And while there are definitely merits to this approach, and I don't recommend scrapping the word of mouth approach, I think that there are things that can be done to enhance that word of mouth approach to make it more equitable. Because unfortunately, what the word of mouth approach has, um, like the downside of it is that it has the potential to, and it does, has perpetuated longstanding um, inequities and, and kind of makes it worse. So I think that things that can be done are um, reaching deeper into our, like reaching deeper into our networks, having everybody equally on the board reach more deeply into their networks, people that they have um, worked with, people that they might be a second degree connection with, let's say on LinkedIn, um, you know, just really kind of going out there and trying, trying a little bit harder on that word of mouth approach. Um, I also think that there are tons of associations, um, community associations, um, professional associations um, throughout um, Toronto in this case, or your community that can be tapped into. Um, like one example would be um, the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers is, is one that, you know, could be reached out to. Um, and then finally, um, and then, sorry, in the selection process as well, um, being having things like um, an objective, um, more, more objective rubric um, with weighting and scoring, and and removing from that rubric on on evaluating candidates, removing things like cultural fit. The cultural fit is where we can drop in there, or where we don't realize where we might put our, some of our implicit biases. So taking away that very subjective cultural fit for example, from a rubric um, would be something to do to kind of in, to enhance equity in this selection process. And then finally, just a note on term limits. Term limits are a mechanism um, for which to, to keep that board turnover, like when, when seats are open to fill it with somebody um, to, to enhance diversity on the board. Um, and I also realized I jumped right in before mentioning that when I talk about diversity um, in my in my report and findings and, and research, we, it was really about um, age, gender, identity, sexual orientation, ability, and race. So this is when I talk about diversity, I speak of it in those areas. Meredith, I hate to do this, but um, uh, time is going by. Um, can um, uh, can, can I ask you to quicken the pace a little bit? We want to make sure that we hear from Robin sure. and then have time for, for questions after. No really problem. Sorry to, really sorry. No problem. Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially I looked at, um, I did a survey of my classmates and found out why there might be um, a lack of a representation of younger generations on boards. And uh, you can see what it is on the screen here, basically that we're unaware of opportunities. They seem inaccessible that we have to be really successful and have 20 years of experience to sit on the board. Um, and then there are things that we can do to, um, that we're, there are things that millennials and the younger uh, generations can contribute. You'll see here that, that we're, what we're driven by, giving back, passion, networking, things that we can bring to the table um, are really important. And I, I just, if it's one thing that I wanna highlight, it's that fresh perspective. Um, every single one of my classmates who I surveyed said that they, that younger generations they believe can bring a fresh perspective to the board. Um, and that ties back to when I talk about that diversity of thought that is a benefit of having diversity on a board, it's being brought that fresh perspective to enhance board outcomes. And then also to make board structure a little bit more amenable to younger generations. Um, one thing, and I think um, this also connects back, back to what Dan was saying, is, uh, is something that Board. And I'm willing to join now, um, if only, um, you know, opportunities present themselves. Um, and I will end it. Thank you, Meredith. Um, I think your screen froze a little bit, but um, uh, one of my questions for you is going to be um, 
uh, how we as boards, as organizations need to change, what we need to do to attract young and culturally, culturally diverse people to our boards. I think that's a, a full discussion that we might be able to get into uh, during some of the Q&A. Uh, Robin, can you please um, uh, join us now? Robin, you're, you, I think you're um, muted. Robin's still muted. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, here we go. So, um, so I was then invited to talk about the, a report that uh, I was recently involved in, um, in, in publishing and based on a, a research study that a colleague of mine at Rotman, Matt Fulbrook and myself uh, completed. And uh, thank you to Denny and Meredith for your remarks. And I think my remarks build on yours, uh, talking about recruitment and diversity. Really our, our report asked a provocative question that um, it, uh, diversity and inclusion, is it essentially window dressing? And, and, and we talked to 26 leaders in the sector to, to try to address that question. Um, in the course of that, we, our report really touches on six themes. Uh, and the first theme really is, if you like, the headline theme, which is that uh, board diversity is unlikely to be effective unless there's a parallel commitment to inclusion. We had many stories of organizations that were that that were working on recruiting board members from diverse backgrounds, but really hadn't given a lot of thought to what would happen beyond that. One example uh, um, out of the 26 people we spoke to was a, a wonderful today very experienced board member, an indigenous woman who was telling me the story of, of the first board she was appointed to where well, there was a lot of fanfare about the board having their first indigenous uh, uh, board member. But really, once they'd introduced her, they then ca just carried on uh, as, uh, as though it was business as usual, completely missing the opportunity that they had uh, made a significant step in, in the area of board diversity. Um, and, it, and it was up to her really to then push back outside the meeting with the chair and, um, and, the, and, and the CEO to, to find ways for her to be able to um, contribute to the work of the board and to help the board being more in, uh, to become more inclusive. The second theme uh, is, is that uh, successful inclusion uh, uh, depends on the determined leadership from the chair. Now, many of us may assume that that, that that is a given. And in all the people we spoke to, in fact, what we found was that all the chairs we heard about are essentially supportive of diversity and inclusion. But being supportive of, of diversity and inclusion is not the same as, have, as showing determined leadership uh, in, in the area. Um, often the chair was very busy with many, many other things and the, the, whole, the whole diversity and inclusion agenda was left to others to implement. And, and what we found was that without that demonstration of, of, of real leadership and commitment from the chair, it, the, the issue often got sidelined. A very good news story we heard here was, was from the Responsible Gaming Council, uh, Council and where, where, where the chair, uh, Hamlin Grange, who uh, it, it happens to be a specialist in the area of diversity and inclusion, was able to build uh, diversity and inclusion related um, uh, agenda items all the way through uh, the work uh, of the board. The, the third uh, theme we, uh, we have is, 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 um, is that really board candidates at the point of being interviewed need to take the time to, uh, to inquire about how they might contribute to the organization. I think this picks up on one of Denny's stories or, or a similar theme where it isn't always clear why a candidate is being recruited. And we've often been in situations of recruiting someone from a diverse uh, community, but not putting that on the table. So here we had stories, and I'll, I'll just share two completely different stories of, 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 of individuals who, who, who quickly felt in an in a interview process that frankly, they were being asked because the board wanted to improve their diversity standing. And they hadn't given a lot of thought beyond that as to how the candidate would contribute. 
In one case, the candidate felt really annoyed by that and essentially walked away um, uh, from the opportunity, feeling that that there was not going to be a match. Interestingly, in another case, the candidate said, well, you know, I I don't feel so good about the fact that they didn't give a lot of thoughts to uh, how I would contribute. However, I feel I can contribute and I'm going to say yes, because I uh, because I will really would like to be able to contribute to this organization. Um, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm not suggesting that that, that one, answer, one approach is right or the other answer uh, or, the, or the other one is wrong. Uh, the point I'd like to make is that in the really it's up to the candidate uh, in that situation to push back to make sure that that he or she understands why they're being why they are being recruited and it's up to the recru recruiting uh, board chair nominating committee chair or whoever it is to be again completely transparent and open about about the reasons for um, for the recruitment the next theme is about that onboarding needs to be uh, reimagined. What we felt, what we found was that the one size fits all um, onboarding process uh, really doesn't work well enough when we're trying to recruit a diverse board. We really do need to find ways to personalize the onboarding for each individual uh, board opportunity in order to assist every board member to contribute uh, to, uh, to the best of their ability. Um, next, we said that lived experience um, can, can contribute hugely to the, the diversity of perspectives I'm on the board. Here, I'll share an example from my own experience. Uh, a number of years ago, I was on the board of Casey House, which, which, is, an, uh, which is a hospice for, uh, for people uh, uh, experiencing advanced stages of AIDS and, uh, AIDS and HIV. Um, on the bylaws of the organization was that there would be at least two board members who were who, who would who completely open about the fact that they were living with, with AIDS and HIV. And uh, from my experience, I can't tell you how much that added to the ability of the board being able to understand what our what, what our purpose was and why we were there, and uh, uh, the, the 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 last of the six themes uh, is that what we found as we were working through this and talking to leaders was really the principles of diversity are aligned with all the principles of good governance. Which so so diversity needs good thoughtful recruitment. Well, good governance needs good thoughtful rec recruitment. Onboarding needs to be personalized. Well, it, that's not just for candidates from diverse communities, it's for all candidates. The board needs to be able to recognize, the, the board chair needs to be able to recognize the individ individual needs and styles of individual board members. Well, that doesn't just apply to, um, to diverse candidates, it applies to all, uh, to all board members. So interestingly, as we got into this, we found that organizations that are focusing on improving their diversity and inclusion were really improving their board governance practices across the board. Um, so the last piece of our report was touching on uh, a number of recommendations, but th there are about 30 recommendations in the report. So obviously I'm not going to go through them, but we, but, but we broke them up into um, sections about recommendations for board candidates, uh, board chairs, and so on. I'll just touch on one for each, for each category. Um, for board candidates, uh, one recommendation we had, a suggestion is to be proactive about onboarding. Often as a new board member, we sit back and wait for management or, or, or the governance and nominating committee to initiate the onboarding. And yes, that is their role. Uh, However, as a board candidate, as a new board member, we could also be proactive in, in asking a bunch of questions at board meetings and before and after board meetings. Uh, for board chairs, um, uh, one, one piece of advice that came through was keep tabs of who is speaking and not speaking at, 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 board, at board meetings, particularly as you're trying to diversify the board, whether it's through age, cultural background, people from BIPOC communities, people have different levels of comfort around contributing at the boardroom table. And it's partly the board chair's role to see who is contributing, who is not contributing at the table. And, and to find ways for those who don't have the comfort level at the table to make sure they have other ways of contributing. Uh, for CEOs and executive directors, uh, what one recommendation is to make sure, and I think, uh, I think Denny touched on this already, to make sure that, that, that every new board member has both a board buddy and a management buddy, so that they know who to go to for, for every question they, uh, that, that they might have. For nominating committee chairs, one recommendation, and this, go, this cuts across a lot of performing arts and arts organizations in general, the whole question that of, of needing board members who, who, who can give or get, 
who can contribute themselves or bring people in the door. Um, the, 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 the recommendation is for nominated committees to think beyond that. Everyone can give, everyone can get, but it isn't necessarily in pure dollars. There may be other ways of being able, uh, being able to give or get. And for longstanding board members, um, really the one piece of advice is to be available to mentor new board members. So as I say, the, the, the report is available to you. We have about 30 recommendations. Uh, I do encourage, uh, based on our interviews, that they're not just from Matt and myself. So I do, I do encourage you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to access that. And uh, I think Ginny said at the opening that board composition is at the root of board effectiveness. And really that ties back to recruitment and it ties back to diversity and inclusion. Um, thank you. Unmuting. So I can say thank you, Rob, and that was wonderful. I love the um, connection um, between good governance and um, uh, good practices in recruiting for diversity and equity. It's, um, uh, it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, I would like to just raise one question. Um, um, it's true that after every AGM, uh, after new people join a board always, um, the dynamics around the board table change. So I'm just wondering um, uh, about that question, how can we ensure as um, people who are currently on boards who have been used to certain ways of doing things, certain uh, ways in which discussions unfold, how can we work to ensure that we are actually really open and accepting and, and um, enriching our own understandings through those changes that happen as new people join us. Robin, Actually, I, 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 yeah, I'd like to jump in on that. And in fact, mm -hmm. I would like to challenge that, uh, for that, that, that theory, if I may, Judy. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think in fact, more often than, than not, I think the dynamics don't change. Uh, because I think when you've got, for a typical board, if you've got 15 or 16 or 18 members and one or two new board members come on each, each meeting, uh, it's gonna take them a while to change the dynamics. And I, I think uh, this is anecdotal, but it, it, just from my own experience and the interviewees we, uh, we, we spoke to, the, uh, it was almost the opposite, that the, that the new board members adapt to the culture of the board. Um, more often than not. And I think the challenge in some ways is for the chair uh, and for the longest standing board members, to your point, to be open to change and maybe facilitating and creating the opportunities for change that may not otherwise uh, exist. Good, I think you're right about that. I think that's true. Um, uh, do we have questions um, from our listeners, Jacqueline, that we should get to? Um, now I've yeah. got I've got other things I'm hoping to ask as well, but of course I want to give everybody the opportunity. Absolutely, we might have touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to direct this question to Denny. Uh, Denny, can you share your thoughts on a board skills matrix to help with board renewal and succession in an arts organization? What are the key skills critical to capture in the skills matrix? Ooh, um, well, I don't want to run through a big long list. Uh, if the person wants to get in touch with me, I can show you what we use at the Mendelssohn. It's very specific by organization, and uh, but there are certain fundamental things. Um, we, you know, for instance, we look for knowledge of music, knowledge of the performing arts, um, uh, philanthropic ability, uh, fundraising ability, uh, knowledge of our audience segments, those kinds of things. Uh, specific kinds of uh, skill sets as well. I would, uh, I, I think the simple answer is sit down and ask people, what do we need? I think that's the way we created ours in, in the original was to say, what is it we need in, in the room? But, you know, I'm happy to get into more detail later if that's helpful. And Denny, will those needs change through time? Yeah, I think some will stay fundamental, uh, but uh, I mean, certainly, as you've heard, my bias is always, first and foremost, they have to love the mission, uh, because you can't really teach people to love a mission. They either do, they get it, or they don't. And so that's a fundamental. And then from there, you know, it will change. Some things will change. Some will stay the same. Thank you. 
I'm um, Meredith actually answered this question in our uh, Q and A, but I'm going to ask it out loud and then ask Meredith to kind of reiterate her answer for the rest of our um, attendees here. So the question was, could you please recommend some best practices for recruiting board members? Currently, we depend on personal networks among existing board members, but this is a limited resources. This is a limited resource. Meredith, you had a great answer that I would hope that you would share and potentially expand on. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think it's, I think that there are a lot of um, associations out there to be tapping into. Um, and forgive me if my internet uh, is unstable again. Um, yeah, there are a lot of associations to be tapping into there. Um, I know that there are Charity Village, um, the ICD network, um, of course, of individuals who um, have a designation that might be um, willing and able to join a board. Um, and then it depends, I think, I think it's important to think of um, like the skills that you're looking to bring on as well. Um, so if you want someone with legal, um, you know, with a legal background, um, there are, there's like the South Asian Bar Association as an example. So just thinking of, um, you know, the type of representation that you're looking to increase and also thinking about um, the skills that you're needing to bring on board and going out to um, foundations or going out to associations and tapping into their networks as, as well. And then of course, there's always um, kind of digging um, deep into LinkedIn for people that you might've met before, but that don't immediately come up to your, come up in your mind um, is, is something else um, we talked about. And then they're also um, like less common, but they do exist. Um, uh, are leveraging uh, search consultants. There are some pro bono search consultants out there or just paid um, search consultants. So that's another, that's another method. Good. Great. Janie, did we want to dig into one of your questions? Um, yeah, well, this is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, and we, we sort of um, uh, talked about it just a little bit. Um, uh, there's a lot of, you know, the year past has been a year of so many really profound changes and so many urgent um, uh, issues raised, uh, particularly around diversity, but, but uh, just about how things are done and will we continue to do things in the same old way. So I'm still um, uh, thinking about the idea that boards uh, have to change in certain ways to attract young and culturally diverse people to join us. Um, I wonder if, um, uh, you know, it just seemed to me, particularly if we're looking for people who are from a new generation, um, and that new generation in Toronto is really by definition more culturally diverse than, than older generations have been. Um, uh, one of the things that I want to do uh, or try to do is to ensure that we are, that the whole process of being on a board, the practice of standing on a board is interesting, exciting, and worthwhile to the people that we're looking to attract to our boards. Um, it's a big question, but I would like to hear, Robin, you're nodding your head. Do you have, do you have thoughts there? I think it's a great question, Jenny, and really, really timely and really important. I'm not sure I have any magic answers, but I think you touched on, on something when you talked about the need for, for the opportunity to be exciting and interesting. I think boards, particularly in the arts sector, have a, have a great opportunity to provide experiential opportunities for board members. Uh, and sometimes because we're short of time, we don't do enough of that. So certainly providing more experiential opportunities uh, in the context of the art, both for the at the organization itself and at other organizations um, is, is a great opportunity. Um, I, I, uh, and I'll just uh, I'll add, add one other thing. Uh, throughout my career, I, I've just had an informally ask people, um, what is it that has made board experiences most memorable to them? I, I like asking this question of people who have, um, who've been on many boards. And really two things have um, come out um, in, in, in my experience. Again, purely anecdotal, not research. Number one is when they feel that they themselves were able to influence something that happened at the board. Maybe they were part of creating a new policy, part of bringing in a new donor, uh, part of creating a new partnership, uh, a new idea. 
And the second one was, was having fun. Just simply that it was an opportunity that, that of, of being collegial and having fun. And I think both those are areas that uh, uh, arts boards uh, have lots of opportunities. And in terms of bringing in people from different communities, I think, I think people would respond to those. In my experience, certainly, that's in my experience as a, as a many, many board uh, member participant. Um, um, I think that um, uh, Jacqueline or Alex have just posted up that if people wish to stay, we are actually at our hour mark right now. But it's, um, it's such an interesting and, and really urgent discussion that um, the Toronto Arts Council is going to allow us to just um, uh, stay online a little longer for those people who um, have urgent questions, questions and wish to stay. Um, and we'd like to thank people who have to leave for being here and for um, uh, being part of this webinar for the Creative Champions Network. So um, feel free to leave when you when you need to, um, uh, and feel free to stay if you can. Um, so here's another large question for me. <laughs> unless, unless uh, Jacqueline, there are things that you, that you wish to bring forward that people have um, have uh, have. I have uh, one question here, Jenny, um, and this one's for Denny as well. Um, and it's just your thoughts on you know, are there some best practices or? Or is it different when you're creating and recruiting for a founding board for a new organization versus bringing members onto an established board? I can tell you that I just about finished typing a long answer to that uh, because I, I thought I could get that done in a hurry. So uh, look for it in writing. Uh, uh, this is a really simple thing is to say that a founding board is often in organizations uh, duplicating roles that would eventually be done by staff, but staff don't exist yet. And uh, so you're often recruiting for very practical skill as well as governance ability. And that is necessary too, because the organization is starting up and it needs to define itself better and have policies and things put into place. The transition is challenging and that's where it, I often get pulled in to help because boards move into less day-to-day -day operational work. And sometimes they don't like that. They want to still be doing the hands-on things and staff are trying to figure out, well, if they're doing that, then what's my role? And that's where clashes occur. Uh, and so if you're bringing people in in that transition period, you need to be very clear that you're in a transition period and that you're not looking for people who can on Thursdays and Fridays come into the office and answer the phone anymore because now you have staff. Uh, but you still need the board to do particular things. And you also need to keep in mind that when you're doing your analysis of how the board's functioning, you need to sometimes you know, remind board members, we have staff that do these things now, you need to let go. And, and so I would say those are the key factors is what stage are we at, what's necessary and recruit for that. But more importantly, as every expert will say, Recruit for the future. Don't photocopy your present board. Don't look for clones. Look for what will be necessary to lead this organization in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so um, do we have other questions, um, uh, Jacqueline, or should I raise? Let me raise something that I've been thinking about. Um, we have uh, spent a lot of time and effort um, in our sector, I think, talking about developing, developing emerging leaders. And in that, um, we're talking not just, um, we're, we're, we're certainly talking about professional leaders, or we're talking about artistic leaders, but I think that we should also expand that to talk about developing emerging board leaders. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, what role we as individual organizations or as a sector can play in doing that. And I have a little secondary thought there. Um, how can the leaders who we are developing for their board um, uh, uh, participation and um, uh, contributions, how can they help develop us as boards and as board members? Meredith, please. 
Sure, I can take that to start with. Um, and something I'm just really passionate about, and I'm answering this on the individual organization level rather than the industry level, um, is just that I, I mentioned it earlier, but really that like mentorship goes such a long way. And from the get go, establishing a mentor for a new joiner or even somebody that has been involved at, let's say, events or, and things like that. And that seems like they could be a prospective board member in the future that you kind of spot them and want to start developing them. Just working on um, establishing and, um, and growing certain relationships that even meeting regularly um, from junior to senior board members and so that they can learn um, and that they can grow. And that really helps um, them grow as leaders. And, and uh, I think that answers the first part of your question. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll defer off the second part of your question. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's part of the development of our practices as well, because I'm sure that there are lots of boards who actually are not particularly um, uh, active in, in, in the idea of mentoring new people, or I don't think everybody mentioned that to a certain extent, but the fact that it's, it can be pretty, you really don't want a new board member, as I've heard somebody say quite recently, take a year to figure out you know, how things work and what's going on. You'd like to get people contributing the best they have to contribute from, from very early stages. So um, I think it's something that we should be doing more of and doing a better job of within the arts community. Um, what about small organizations? Um, it, 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 I have noticed that there's um, a kind of urgent desire from young professionals to become involved with um, you know, larger organizations, but smaller organizations, um, surely since so many of us are smaller and so much good artistic work um, goes on within small organizations. Um, what, what kinds of um, uh, things can we do to enhance the appeal of small organizations for prospective board members? Danny, any thoughts there? I confess I was typing a, an answer to somebody else. I was afraid <laughs> we're going to lose people, so I've been trying to type. Okay. Jenny, I completely confess I missed what you. Okay, Meredith. <laughs> um, I could take it and just say, firstly, raising awareness. Um, I think it start even before even before we think about okay, what can the board be doing now to make this experience seem more compelling for prospective candidates? It's just even getting out there and promoting through different channels that this smaller organization exists and that there's a role at the smaller organization. Um, and people will, I mean, I, at least I would feel compelled to get involved, especially maybe if it was my, my first board, then maybe I'd want to, to start small to begin with. But I think just getting the word out there and making um, individuals more aware that these opportunities even exist is a great place to start. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I would agree with Meredith. And just to add to that, I think quite often the, the actual work that someone might do at a small organization is much more uh, strategic, far-reaching, that there are many more opportunities to influence real change in a small organization than there might be in a larger organization. So the opportunity to learn and to influence real change uh, can be terrific. And we just have to make that case, I think, um, more clearly. Yes, there's always the, the you know the stars and light uh, about all the, the names of the big organizations but often the in, in those or it, it's more difficult to have real influence um compared uh, compared to the, the learning and influence at a small organization absolutely yeah i think that um uh, board members of small organizations seem sometimes seem to underestimate um just what a wonderful opportunity um, inviting somebody to join their board is. Um, and therefore they hesitate um, because um, they make assumptions about what people want and what people need from their board participation that might not be um, actually true or realistic. Um, I'm going to ask our uh, panelists, is there a question or a, a final thought or a question that you'd like to ask um, your fellow panelists or to make yourself. Denny, surely you have. 
Okay, well, I'll throw one out. I just assumed the chair of the Toronto Medicine Choir Board. I've been in senior staff roles in two major arts organizations, but I've never chaired a board of one. So I'm curious from your experience, what should I be aware of doing and not doing as a chair? I think I would, I would jump in and offer a couple of uh, a couple of thoughts. Thoughts, great, great question. Um, I, I think one is uh, what would be to identify fellow board members who could be who could provide you with honest feedback um, before and after meeting. Because often that, uh, again, maybe this was mentioned, as Canadians, we tend to be so polite that uh, often when uh, people are reluctant to give, uh, to offer constructive feedback. Uh, so so cert certainly that would, uh, would, would, would be one. Um, and, and another would be to, uh, to touch base with board members uh, before and after a meeting, and I'm sure you're doing this on, 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 on particularly on, on any contentious um, items to, uh, to, to, to try to get a sense of, 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 where, of where, where, what the mood of the board is, at least of, of key influence uh, makers uh, is on the board. And, and the question um, uh, that Robin, you raised, or the fact that you raised that questions of uh, change and especially diversity um, uh, movements there. Somebody um, who I thought was smart d d defined the search for uh, uh, diversity and, and, and other good changes to be relentless incrementalism, um, which I think is a really good way to think about it. The incrementalism um, means that it does take, that every good change takes time. But Relentless offers that um, idea that it is something that must be done and that must be addressed and that must be kept in mind in order for change and success to happen. Um, and that includes any, really, there's so many um, important changes around um, how boards work. There's a lot of people um, that I've been listening to recently and reading recently who have been um, soul searching about whether boards are in actual fact um, uh, the right structures or the necessary structures to ensure sustainability and artistic success of arts organizations. Um, uh, so I think that uh, part of the answer to that question is to really um, make our boards um, more open, more reflective of community, more self-reflective. Um, Meredith, did you say having fun? I mean, I totally, or I think that was Robin. I think it's really true. It, could there be anything more really fun and interesting than being together with a group of colleagues, peers, friends, new friends, old friends, to help make an arts organization flourish. Um, uh, I, that, that's fun as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, okay, are there any other uh, last thoughts, last questions? Yes, Denny. I just, I wanna say that uh, I did this as a staff person and I don't think I did it enough in, to engage board members. And that's when you get down in the details and it, you're working really hard. It's really important and we are lucky this way in the arts, it's really important to take yourself into the hall or the theater and sit down and say, I'm part of this, I'm helping make this happen. We get so caught up in office and boardroom situations and we lose sight of the magic and the, the extraordinary privilege that we have to be a part of these organizations. And so get your board members to rehearsals, get them into the hall, make sure they they, and make sure they understand they're part of that, that it isn't come and observe the excellent pro professionals. Aren't we lucky they're here, but make it clear that we're all in this together. We need each other. Absolutely. I think we have come to the end of our time frame. Am I right, Jacqueline? I think so. Um, we said we would try to extend for 15 minutes and we have done that. Um, I would really like to thank everybody on our panel for excellent ideas, thoughts, um, inspiration, um, experience that they've shared with us today. 
Um, and to thank everybody who has been listening, we still have quite a few people online with us. So I thank you for your um, for logging in and for sticking with the conversation. Um, Denny had said that he's open to questions and um, uh, I would add that I am too. Um, so uh, get in touch um, uh, and um, stay in tune with Creative Champions Network um, and the next sessions coming along. I don't think that we're at the position quite yet to announce the name or the presenters at our next session, but that's going to come really soon. So thank you to everybody um, and um, enjoy the day. It's pretty beautiful out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to see everyone.